Good morning class. Today we will learn about the nephrotic syndrome. In the last lecture uh, of the glomerular disease, we have studied the six patterns of the glomerular disease. Number one is acute nephritic syndrome, number two is nephrotic syndrome, number three is pulmonary renal syndrome, number four is glomerulovascular syndrome, number five is antibase membrane, membrane disease and number six is post infectious glomerular disease. So, out of these six the nephrotic syndrome is a condition is a quite common condition and we are going to discuss about this condition today. So, nephrotic syndrome is a glomerular disease. So, in this today's lecture we will discuss about the defining criteria for the nephrotic syndrome. How we can define nephrotic syndrome? What is the criteria? We will discuss that thing. Then we will discuss about the etiology of the nephrotic syndrome. What are the etiologies of the nephrotic syndrome? Then we will discuss about the pathophysiology and clinical feature of nephrotic syndrome. We will also discuss about the complications and the investigation of the nephrotic syndrome. If time permits, we will discuss little bit about the treatment part, but the, as the treatment of the different cause for the nephrotic syndrome is different, it will be the out of scope for this lecture. So, let us go one by one. So, in the outset, I have told you, so nephrotic syndrome is a glomerular disease glomerular disease glomerular disease so normally 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 the urine contains urine contains near about less than 30 mg of albumin in a 24 hour sample yes 30 mg we, we had discussed these things when you are discussing the approach to the renal abnormalities. Urine can contain the albumin amounting less than 30 mg in 24 hour sample. Why is this so? We have discussed when you are discussing the anatomy of the glomerulus because of the presence of the electronegative charge in the basement membrane, it will repulse the negatively charged albumin, though the size of the albumin is smaller than the diameter of the slit diaphragm. Some of the albumin can pass through the glomerulus and can come to the tubules, but most of the albumin get reabsorbed through the tubules. And only small amount of albumin is passed in the urine. But nephrotic syndrome is that condition where we see the large of amount of albumin in the urine. So, the amount of urine that is required 24 to, to require to diagnose the nephrotic syndrome is more than 3 gram of albumin in 24 hour sample more than 3 gram in 24 hour sample in 24 hour. Similarly, when there is albuminuria there is a decrease in the serum albumin level there is decrease in serum albumin level usually less than 2.5 gram per deciliter and consequently it causes the generalized edema and similarly it caused the elevation in the total cholesterol why there is a to elevation in total cholesterol we will discuss later on but to diagnose the, the nephrotic syndrome it should be more than 350 mg per day liter. So, this is the defining criteria for the nephrotic syndrome. 
so if someone if one estimating the albumin in the 24 urine sample if it is more than 3 gram that is 3000 mg and on doing the serum albumin analysis if it is less than 2.5 gram per deciliter and if there is the present of any edema in the patient and if the total cholesterol is more than 350 mg per deciliter you can say that the ma our patients is suffering or are suffering from the nephrotic syndrome okay this is the defining criteria for the nephrotic syndrome we see the nephrotic syndrome in all ages in children in adult and in elderly people the cause for the nephrotic syndrome in this age group may be different but we see this condition in all age group so what are the etiology of this condition what are the etiology of this condition so etiology of this condition is that we it can be the primary cause it can be the secondary cause in the primary cause there is a primarily problem in the glomerulus there is a primary problem in the glomerulus in the secondary cause there is a primary problem lies in the systemic body parts only the effect of that disease occurs in the glomerulus that is called the secondary. So, secondary nephrotic syndrome R is a systemic disease which has also effect upon the glomerulus. So, to divide the nephrotic syndrome into we can divide etiologically it can be the primary nephrotic syndrome it can be the secondary nephrotic syndrome. So, primary nephrotic syndrome commonly we see the condition like minimal sense disease in children it can also occur in the adult minimal sense disease is a primary nephrotic syndrome similarly FACS focal segmental glomerular sclerosis focal segmental glomerular glomerular sclerosis glomerular sclerosis sclerosis membranous glomerulopathy membranous glomerulopathy MPG and membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis. So, this may be the one of the MCQ question that minimal sense disease is the most common type of primary nephrotic syndrome in children and focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is the most common type of primary nephrotic syndrome in adult. This may be the MCQ question for you people. This may be the MCQ question for you people and note it okay this is maybe the mcq equation this is the com more common in children and this is this is the more common in children and this is and this this one is the more common in adult okay this one is a more common in adult adult so secondary nephrotic syndrome as a clinician we see the patient with diabetes who presented with the gross albuminuria so, diabetes is one of the cause of the secondary nephrotic syndrome, diabetes mellitus. Sex similar SLE may, can cause secondary nephrotic syndrome, amyloidosis can cause the secondary nephrotic syndrome, amyloidosis. Different tumors like lymphoma, especially Hosking lymphoma can present with the nephrotic syndrome. There are drugs, there are drugs like penicillamine, it can cause the nephrotic syndrome, penicillamine, we use a penicillamine often in the Wilson's disease. So, these are the secondary cause of the nephrotic syndrome. The it may be the diabetes, but diabetes, SLE, amyloidosis, lymphoma, or it may be drug induced, these are the cause for the nephrotic syndrome. Okay. So, after knowing the etiology of the etiology of the nephrotic syndrome, we will go to the pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome. The problem in the nephrotic syndrome is there is the leakage of the albumin in the urine there is the gross albuminuria. So, as a result of which there, there are two hypotheses one is underfill hypothesis underfill hypothesis another one is the overfill hypothesis overfill hypothesis another one is the overfill hypothesis overfill
Okay. So where under field hypothesis mean when there is the albinuria, when there is albinuria in the urine, it decreases the serum albumin level. Serum albumin level. Okay. When it decreases the serum albumin, then in the blood vessel, in the blood vessel, what happened? In the blood vessel, so in the blood vessel, so there are left side, these are the fluids. In the blood vessel, there are two types of pressure. One is hydrostatic pressure, hydrostatic pressure which pushes the fluid to the interstitial space. This is the interstitial space. Another one is the oncotic pressure, oncotic pressure. Okay. So, similarly, similarly there is also hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure in the interstitium. But when there is a decrease in serum albumin, it decreases the oncotic pressure of the oncotic pressure of the intravascular compartment. There is a decrease in oncotic pressure of the intravascular compartment. When there is a decrease in intravascular oncotic pressure, then there and the hydrostatic pressure is remain, remain same, it like the water escapes from this space to the this space. This is called the underfill hypothesis and ultimately it causes the edema. Edema. And when there is a edema, like, like when the water escapes from this space to th this space, there is an intravascular depletion in the intravascular compartment and that can be detected by our RAS system. Ultimately, it, it can be detected by renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system and it causes the sodium retention ultimately. So, the primarily in the underfill hypothesis, is, it tells that there is a low level of albumin which decreases the oncotic pressure. So, that fluid escapes from intravascular space to the interstitial space. So, there is a depletion in intravascular volume. When there is a depletion in intravascular volume, then the RAS system get activated and it ultimately leads to the sodium retention. So, this is the one of the pathophysiology of the nephrotic syndrome. Similarly, overfill hypothesis. In overfill hypothesis, it tells that when there is albumin excretion, when there is albumin excretion, when there is albumin excretion or albumin filtration from the tubule from in the tubule in the tubule of the kidney when there is albumin the albumin will stimulate the sodium absorption sodium absorption albumin will stimulate the sodium absorption so that the sodium absorption reabsorption in the tubules in the pct will be increased increase and that sodium retention will ultimately cause the edema so so, in the underfill hypothesis, the main problem is decrease in level of albumin, whereas in overfill hypothesis, the main problem is increase in sodium reabsorption due to the stimulation by the albumin present in the tubules. So, so these are the two proposed pathophysiology for the nephrotic syndrome. So, when the serum albumin is less than 2 gram per deciliter, then the then the underfill hypothesis applied more. When the albumin is more than 2, then overfill hypothesis is applied more. So, that, uh, so these are the proposed pathogenesis for the nephrotic syndrome. So, we have to understand the overfill and underfill, okay, basically. So, then what are the clinical features of the nephrotic syndrome? The clinical feature of the nephrotic syndrome is that when you see the child, when you see the child, often there is a swelling in the periorbital area. There is a periorbital swelling, periorbital swelling, and periorbital swelling, swelling, periorbital swelling, which progresses and involve, which progresses and involve the whole body, and it also causes the ascites and then ultimately the edema. So. The periorbital swelling is one of the initial manifestation of nephrotic syndrome in child because these area contains the loose areolar tissues so that fluid can easily escape from that region. So, 
The initial manifestation is the peri periarbital swelling which can progress and involve the whole body and cause the anasarca. Similarly, in case of adult, the predominant symptom is edema in the dependent region. Dependent region. They may have other symptoms like decreased appetite and fatigability. So, most of the time when you see a patient with anasarca, gross body swelling, then we usually suspect the nephrotic syndrome as one differential diagnosis. Okay. So, when we ask the patient about other history, they may give you the history of the passage of the frothy urine because of proteinuria, frothy urine like soapy water urine, you may get that history. Similarly, they can present it with us with one of the complication of nephrotic syndrome which we will discuss later on. But these are the common presentation of the nephrotic.